Hello, everyone. Super nice to see a more or less full room today and in a, in a very special day. It's not just that it's uh, snowing outside, but it's uh, because we're restarting the Stockholm Seminar Series, which has been down for obvious reason for a little while. And as many of you knew, we have had a fantastic uh, seminars and the discussions over the years in this, in this uh, quite uh, nice place with uh, very nice speakers. And the Stockholm Seminars is a collaboration with, the, with everyone that you see on the logos down here. It's been going on for, for quite some time. So it's a, a sort of a, it's a manifestation of the Stockholm platform of these type of issues. And today we are super happy to have dear friends and colleagues since a long, long time back, Gretchen Daly and Steve Polaski. And the sort of, sort of as a top of that, Tong Wu, <laughs> making the cake even more beautiful. So, so, and we're going to we're going to hear about uh, something which is actually very much needed and extremely fascinating and exciting, and that's how to develop new ways of capturing what what the biosphere and nature, the natural capital, means for for us as a species now in these uh, turbulent times we're in. So, I, I'm happy to leave the floor to. Gretchen Daly from Stanford, Steve Polesky from Minnesota, and Tom Wu from, from Stanford. The floor is yours. Okay. Okay, great, thanks. Great, thank you all. Um, it is really wonderful to be back and I'm very glad that the Stockholm seminars are now back. Um, uh, yeah, so today we're, we're gonna talk about uh, gross ecosystem product. Um, so we're gonna do this as sort of a, a tag team. Uh, I'm gonna start off and, and talk about um, why we need gross ecosystem product and how do we uh, calculate it. And then uh, Gretchen is gonna talk uh, some about where is this being uh, taken up, and then uh, Tong is going to uh, uh, provide many examples, um, especially from from China, about why this is um, how this is is going beyond just a new measure, and and really talking about how this can be uh, an attractor for social innovation and transformation. Okay, so let me uh, start in. So. We know that um, in the 20th century, we were living in uh, the Holocene. Um, the, most of the, so my background is in economics. Most of economics was basically driven by a worldview where nature was plentiful. Uh, so, you know, we had this sort of linear model, we get resources in from the environment and we put out waste and there's an unlimited capacity to absorb waste and there's unlimited resources. Of course, we know that that's false, um, but the, the economic systems were really designed to um, grow the economy, to grow GEP. And in the 20th century, especially since 1950, we were spectacularly successful um, at that activity. So, you know, on the right hand side, that's just global G, uh, GDP growing, right? The measure of economic activity. But we don't live in the Holocene anymore, as many from Stockholm have, have pointed out. We live in the Anthropocene, where it's human actions which are driving um, global environmental change. And uh, that's been leading to all kinds of difficulties from climate change uh, to loss of biodiversity uh, to everything else. And, and you know, here in Stockholm, of course, I don't need to tell most of you uh, this, but we still have, especially in the economy, Holocene institutions in an Anthropocene world. And so part of what we need here is to move beyond the kind of metrics and approaches that we had uh, for the 20th century and to think about what do we need uh, in the 21st century. Um, so many people have talked about moving beyond GDP. So the, the book here is actually uh, a book um, that came out of a commission this was from uh, the government of France uh, back in 2010. So two Nobel laureates in economics about why we need to have better measures that go beyond just a measure of economic performance, but to think about 
uh, ecological, economic, and social systems and how well they are doing to support human well-being now, but also into the future. So thinking about sustainability and resilience. Um, so we currently lack uh, a measure of um, ecological performance, of wider social performance. Um, I'm not going to talk as much about the social side, but I will talk about trying to incorporate the economic performance um, into a measure of gross ecosystem product, which parallels gross domestic product. Um, but as I say, we currently lack such a, an integrator or attractor. Um, and of course, what, what's the busy chart that's on the right, this comes from um, work that came out of uh, IPBES, the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. And basically, all I really want you to get from the graph on the right or the, the figure on the right is, is those things in orange, those are the rows are different uh, ecosystem services or types of ecosystem services. And the orange are where the past 50 years, the trend has been downward, right? So we did spectacularly well in growing GDP. We have done spectacularly poorly in maintaining the flows of ecosystem services. So part of the motivation for gross ecosystem product is to actually track our performance and hopefully do better on our performance on the ecological side, um, not just on the kind of conventionally measured economics uh, that, that, we've, that we've tracked in GDP. So in the 1930s, you know, we, we, we have not had GDP forever. Uh, um, it may seem like that, but uh, we have not had gross domestic product or measures of economic performance, but it was really the Great Depression in the 1930s that pushed for you know, policymakers realize that they needed measures of macroeconomic performance uh, to help guide economic policy. Well, as the last chart showed and, and uh, work here in Stockholm and elsewhere uh, in the Anthropocene, we are in the middle of a great degradation of nature, and we really need, we desperately need uh, better uh, information, better metrics to help guide sustainable development. So that's really the motivation for, uh, uh, for GDP. Now, there's a relationship, excuse me, for GEP. <laughs> there's a relationship between gross ecosystem product, GEP, and GDP. In fact, we tried to design this in a way uh, which, which was very parallel. So GDP is a summary metric of the flows, uh, the value of the flows of marketed goods and services. So the value of what goes through the economy. What GEP is, is a it's very parallel. It's, it's a measure of the flow of the value of ecosystem goods and services. So the value of the flow of nature's contributions uh, to people. There's overlap as, as these figures show. So some of what is measured in GDP is also in GEP and vice versa. So there are marketed ecosystem goods and services. So fisheries and timber and uh, ecotourism. But many things that nature does are not do not show up in GDP. And that's, that's part of our problem. The conventional measures of ecos of, of um, the economy leave out much of what uh, nature contributes. So think about uh, aesthetics or contributions to mental health or contributions to air quality or water quality or biodiversity. So this measure of GEP, what we're trying to capture is all of the values, or at least all the ones that we can we, that we can measure uh, and, and value, of nature. So how is nature contributing to human well-being? So again, some of those are, are already measured in conventional uh, economic uh, terms in GDP. So things like agriculture, uh, forestry, tourism, but many things are not. So these quote non-market values or the, the things which go outside of conventional economic uh, measures. That's what we're really uh, trying to get to in GEP and, and promote those so that they, so that nature is no longer invisible to decision makers. Um, there are a couple of things that I want to say uh, just to put things in perspective. So in developing GEP, we really did try to follow 
what will make this quite similar to GDP. Now that has pluses, it also has minuses. A couple of the minuses, one is that um, GDP is a measure of the value of goods and services that go through the economy. It is not a welfare measure, as good economists should tell you. Um, it's it's uh, just a measure of what's going, you know, what's the value of, of, of goods and services in the economy. So think about the following thought experiment. If you reduced access uh, to some good, uh, in economic terms, if, if it's inelastic demand, so if you raise, you see me, you, you restrict supply, prices go way up, supply doesn't go way down, um, the quantity doesn't go way down, then GDP can go up. I mean, people are worse off. You've restricted supply, but the GDP measure, because it's just price times quantity, uh, goes up. So GEP, it's got the same structure, so it's it's also not a welfare measure. The other thing on GDP, um, and here also for GEP, um, it's a measure of current income, right? So it's not a measure of wealth. And arguably for sustainable development, you really want a, a measure of wealth. So um, for both GDP and for GEP, you really want to be able to track uh, the sustainable component of this. So you're not for example, pulling down the fishery, harvesting all the fish now, which would raise GDP, but at the expense of future generations. So it's important to have measures of wealth, measures of the stocks of capital or of, of natural capital in particular, um, and not just GEP. So I, I, I wanna just emphasize that this is one component of the kinds of metrics um, that we are going to need uh, for this transformation. So in addition to GEP, it's also important to track natural capital and changes in natural capital. Okay, I'm gonna take just a few moments and talk about, so what is GEP? How do we actually measure this? You know, can we uh, come up with you know, hard boiled numbers uh, for uh, gross ecosystem product? So there's really four steps in uh, trying to create uh, an estimate of gross ecosystem product. The first is to actually track the natural capital. So how is natural capital changing? What are the stocks um, of it? Um, the second step is translating those natural capital stocks into flows of the ecosystem goods and services, which are the measures that are gonna go into GEP. The third is to price those goods and services. How valuable are they? How much do they contribute to human well-being? And then the fourth is aggregating up those measures of goods and services into a total gross ecosystem product. So I'll walk through quickly each of those four steps and then there will be examples um, as we go on with Gretchen uh, and Tong. Okay, so the first is again, tracking uh, the magnitude and the quality or condition of the stocks of natural capital that give rise to these ecosystem goods and services. Um, in China, where a lot of this work has uh, was originated, and Tong will talk uh, in particular more about this, um, we benefited from the existence of the China Ecosystem Assessment, which took uh, is periodically done to measure um, the status and the quality of, um, of natural capital. Um, this is being done now in China on a regular basis. Um, so on a five-year cycle, uh, they will keep going on trying, you know, systematically measuring um, these ecosystem, uh, these, these natural capital assets. Okay, the second step is translating again from the natural capital to how do we get to the flows of ecosystem services? These are the things that we're actually going to value and put into, into GEP. Um, so we have used, uh, as part of the Natural Capital Project, um, uh, this integrated valuation of ecosystem services and trade-offs. It's a model, a set of models, um, which take in natural capital, the conditions of natural capital, uh, and predict the flows of ecosystem services that result. Um, again, in China, where a lot of this work uh, originated, um, 
this is uh, we we benefited from both the, uh, the the China ecosystem assessment, but also the application of invest models to talk about or to be able to quantify uh, various sets of ecosystem services um, and have done this then through time. Okay, so the third step is then uh, changing from a biophysical measure of the flows of ecosystem services into a value statement so that we can put this into a common denominator, common monetary metric, um, and aggregate these in the fourth step. Um, so um, some ecosystem services have market prices. Okay, so we can use market prices for timber, for fisheries, for agriculture, um, that's fine. Many others do not, that's the problem. And so there are a set of non-monetary or non-marketed uh, pricing approaches that economists uh, have developed. Um, I won't go into these in depth, but I'll just give you a couple of examples. So um, you could think about, for example, this avoided cost. Um, so if, if we have maintained uh, mangroves or um, other, um, uh, natural like wetlands or, or um, uh, you know, uh, natural ecosystems that provide shelter from, from storms or absorb floodwaters. Um, we avoid the cost of, of damaging floods. Um, imputed costs, we can think about um, when uh, pollinators uh, provide crops, they inc increase either the, the quantity or the value of the crops. We can look at how much did they increase the quantity or the quality, and then use the marketed price for those crops to impute the value um, of pollinators. Okay, so I won't say that we've got great methods for all things, but but there are a number of of ecosystem services in this non-marketed ecosystem service category for which we can come up with reasonable estimates. And then the final step here is to aggregate uh, these up into, uh, in, into GEP. So if we've done our job well, we have calculated all at least the important ecosystem services. We've avoided double counting. So I can't count both the value of the pollinators and the value of the crop separately. It gets counted uh, one time. And uh, we then have a, you know, calculating up this, this measure of gross ecosystem product uh, for a particular area, like let's say a province in China uh, or a part of Sweden for a given time period, which measures the values of nature's contributions, both to the economy and ultimately um, to human well-being. So with that, uh, Gretchen, I'm going to turn it over to you and you will carry on the story. <laughs> Hey, well, I want to repeat Steve's really heartfelt thanks. It's just fantastic um, being here together as a team, having worked for so many years together with everybody here in Stockholm and um, being able to get your feedback here and restarting this seminar on where to head with some work that really originated in terms of ideas here um, back in the 90s when the Bayer was founded and so on. So um, just to carry on then, um, I'll be getting into following from Steve, really describing the need for a metric and a system behind it, like GEP around the world. Now we'll go more deeply into how this idea of the need was um, developed into the first actual demonstration in China, and then pass on to Tong, who will talk some about how um, things are really, um, a lot of innovation is underway. It's sort of kind of at an academic and more of a top-down level, um, but now we're seeing a lot of innovation more bottom-up. So it's, it's really exciting, actually. Um, and we're also seeing a lot of interest internationally. So um, just to dive into um, how this all can work, in a little more specifics. The approach was to develop something that any place could apply in the world. So it really depended on having at least globally available data from remote sensing and other kind of pixel by pixel uh, metrics of ecosystem condition, you know, kind of the state of natural capital 
um, together with ideally monitoring a lot of which is going on in some places, including in China, 140,000 different ground truthing sites that are used to match what's detected with instrumentation on the ground with that inferred from satellite imagery. And um, then using the invest models that I'll describe a little more in a minute um, to calculate these values. And just to kind of state again, what the purpose is, there's number one, just um, the aim of um, revealing basically the contribution of ecosystems to the economy and to society broadly. The number two is to guide, you know, and inform financial compensation between upstream and downstream players in the system. So in China today, there's already about 200 million people being paid for stewardship of ecosystems um, through different payment mechanisms. But the idea is generally that people downstream, downwind, somehow down in the system of supply chains are compensating people for shifts in practices toward um, nature positive, regenerative approaches, especially in agriculture and in grazing, that kind you know, forestry, all of those areas across the country. And then third, um, a key purpose is just to be able to track, like Steve was saying, the kind of the performance of policies and the leaders meant to implement them performance and investments and so on. So let's dive into the first case. It was picked very strategically um, in China and globally. It's a really significant place, the water tower of Asia. It's a remote and poor place with relatively low data availability. So we wanted to try this out um, in a way that could be developed all across the world. It's a place undergoing a lot of change, some of which is driven very much locally through overgrazing and that kind of thing, declining ecosystem quality, reductions in um, quite unique biodiversity. Also some really global impacts as well through climate change in Qinghai. Um, so anyway, it seemed a, a perfect place to start. And using the methods that um, Steve elaborated just those four steps. Um, we, I'm going to show you what it looks like, basically. So working first with a focus within Qinghai at a district level. So take a note of the shape of Qinghai province. So that's the province, and those are the, the districts in the province. And up on the upper left, you'll see um, the different categories of goods and services, material goods and services. And then one um, on ecotourism that's getting slightly into the cultural services domain. But here you'll just see, you know, we got data across district by district on crop production in monetary terms. I'm gonna show you both types of units. Um, here, similarly for forestry production, here using satellite imagery and modeling, <clears throat> able to quantify water supply here in terms of volume, and then later to convert this to a monetary metric looking at the different uses of water supply, basically within Qinghai and also downstream um, for industry, domestic use in agriculture, irrigation, and also in hydropower. So different market prices for those different uses in the different downstream areas and within Qinghai. Um, flood mitigation, same kind of thing. We have very much finer scale data and the downstream impacts really depend on what's going on in the, a place, but looking at avoided um, damages, sandstorm prevention, carbon sequestration. Um, then here's the cool part, really looking at Qinghai there, in the kind of part of the upper elevations, getting into the upper elevations of China at all of the downstream beneficiaries. And we can imagine doing something along these lines with this same kind of methodology globally, um, you know, or across other regions. But anyway, sticking to one country for now, you can see the um, benefits going to these different regions, just in terms of water supply, flood mitigation, you get a different picture for each of the services, which is 
really gets their mind going as to how people, economies, um, you know, and activities are connected, or interconnected, interdependent. There's water purification. Here we were looking mostly um, at hydropower and avoided dredging costs um, through reduced um, flux of um, mostly sediment, which I think sandstorm prevention. Um, and here's the ecotourism result. So it just gives you a picture of how you can play around with, with the approach. Um, and the other really cool thing, we did this in, published the approach in 2020, right as the pandemic was beginning to unfold, then worked um, hard at crazy hours with the UN and saw the approach approved alongside the UN CIA accounting system in 2021. And um, since then, there's been a lot of interest. Um, so the Natural Capital Project with Mary Ruckel's house really leading over all these years um, has developed kind of in-person collaborations, partnerships with um, key entities across about 60 to 70 countries worldwide. And many of them are paying attention and really getting interested um, and in support of that, uh, the multilateral development banks have, um, I guess this was in 2021, this statement was issued at the Climate COP that year up in Glasgow. You know, we, the MDBs, commit to clearly setting out institutional strategic approaches to further mainstream nature into our policies, analysis, assessments, advice, investments, and operations by 2025. So it's a pretty huge commitment with the MDBs operating more and more as a system, wanting this systematic approach kind of at their fingertips and wanting to develop capacity within countries, um, not just within the central banks, but with, me with many types of actors in countries to be able to track nature and human dependence and impacts on nature. Um, the set of countries that originally signed this and Hopefully more will be piling on, include this, this group here, um, who together invest about 220 billion per year, you know, in the name of development and now are really shifting the conceptualization. This was also thanks to a lot of work here at Stockholm led by various people. Um, Gary, I know deeply involved in and others in um, the UNDP and other programs. So what it means for our partnership um, involving intimately um, Stockholm and um, uh, Minnesota, Stanford, and other about 400 um, actual research partners together with implementing partners is that the um, MDBs, and here I'm showing Asian Development Bank, Inter-American, the World Bank, you know, and then different parts of the UN system, and then a lot of central banks are really getting on board to help um, um, in the suite of functions we need to advance in order to enable not just calculations, say, of GDP, our focus here, but the ability to deploy this kind of thinking and analysis across um, many types of institutions, like Steve was saying, advancing from the Holocene into the Anthropocene. We need a lot of institutional development. So behind this, we have the invest. Um, software system that Steve alluded to that um, we really share. We're all contributing, you know, thousands of researchers have contributed directly and indirectly to the models supported behind each of these broad categories of benefits that come from ecosystems to society. And um, just to touch on one last bit before turning over to Tong, um, the excitement coming up in April that will involve a bunch of people from Stockholm is um, that there's tremendous demand on the part of the United Nations Global Environment Facility to support this capacity development across countries. So here, in addition to the ones in which we've already been um, quite deeply engaged, there's a suite listed under the Asian Development Bank, Inter-American, and then the World Bank and African Development Bank working together to build capacity in, 
It's to deploy these approaches in a number of different types of contexts, including debt relief and that sort of thing. But um, a bunch of the countries are really keen to understand and build capacity to deploy GEP as well. So um, with that as the backdrop, let me turn over now to Tong. Thank you. Thank you. It's um, it's a great honor to be here. I, I think I was first in this room in 2016 when I was a Bayer Young Scholar, and now I'm only a Bayer Youngish, <laughs> re relatively young scholar. It's been seven years. Um, so um, both uh, Stephen Gretchen alluded to the fact that we're the Anthropocene, and really, gross ecosystem product is an indicator necessitated by the, the Anthropocene. Just as GDP was an uh, indicator for the Holocene economy, we think GEP is an important indicator for the Anthropocene economy. And perhaps nowhere in the world, no country in the world has experienced the Anthropocene in a more accelerated rate and at a larger scale than in China. I, I give it the cute little name of a, a Sinocene uh, uh, as a, a, a sub period of the Anthropocene. A lot of the statistics that you often see about China. Um, on the right-hand side, these are or graphs, uh, very much like those great acceleration graphs that you see uh, in the in the canonical papers on on this topic. But also on the left, one of the these really eye-opening and 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 statistics is that uh, in the three years from 2011 to 2013, China poured a lot more cement than the U.S. did in all of the 20th century. So that gives you a sense of. Um, really the, the, the way that China has transformed it, its economy and of course the implications that has for the environment. Um, on the left, this is the, the city of Shenzhen, which started out in the 19, late 1970s, 1980s as a really largely rural area, a collection of fishing and farming communities. And in the course of a generation, it's turned into this metropolis. Um, and, uh, and the statistics here is that uh, approximately there's 20 million residents living in Shenzhen, a little bit more than 20 million in an area uh, that's about one third the size of Stockholm County. So if you add the population of Sweden, Denmark and Norway together and you put it in about one third of the area of Stockholm County, and then you know, this is kind of what you might get. Um, or maybe you get something better. Uh, <laughs> Um, and then, of course, uh, Shenzhen is only one part of this much larger uh, urban agglomeration in China called the Greater Bay Area. So um, every time I say Greater Bay Area, I put it in quotation marks because there is the Bay Area, the San Francisco Bay Area, and the greater here is not a normative judgment. Um, <laughs> Uh, but it's 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 part of the branding, so I, I have to list it. But the Greater Bay Area, as as you see for this from this land cover map, it's over, just over the course of twenty years, it's really expanded. And today, there's about eighty million people living in the in the cities of the Greater Bay Area, which includes Hong Kong. And the economy is uh, has grown very substantially as well. So this is another example of kind of the Chinese Anthropocene experience. But of course, this has come in a great environmental costs. Um, on the left, uh, this is a very famous landscape painting. It's a classic of the genre of Chinese nature painting, and it's from the 12th century, and it's called Summer Mountains. Um, and it really captures, I think, um, the, the way that Chinese society has historically valued nature as a really integral part of their self-conception, as what it means to be Chinese. And on the right, this is a, a painting by a modern artist from 2006. And he essentially took the Summer Mountains painting and he transformed the mountains into kind of clusters of gray high rises and he turned the trees into these construction cranes. And the painting, he did a series of these paintings. It was meant to be a critique about the, co the environmental costs of industrialization in China. Not only what we were losing in terms of nature, but we were what Ch the Chinese society was losing in terms of its cultural identity and its history. And this really made a big impact uh, when the series of paintings first came out. And so this is kind of a, a slightly long-winded way of, of saying that really in the Anthropocene, we need new models of development. And that new model of development 
depends on greater investment in natural capital. It depends on centering natural capital as the foundation for the improvement of human well-being and social welfare. Uh, a term that's often used in China is called a high quality development as opposed to high growth development, which was the previous model. Because we've already seen what the, the benefits, but also the costs of the high growth model are. And now we're transitioning to this high quality development model with nature really as a center of it. And so GEP is part of this. Uh, it is an example, uh, um, I think uh, one of the best examples of a, of a natural capital-based development strategy, a natural capital approach to development. And it first starts with assessment and the modeling and the mapping uh, under really understanding the, the distributions, the conditions and the value of ecosystems and how they've changed over time. And then we go into accounting, the valuation and the aggregation into commensurable monetary values. Um, and then, of course, based on those, based on the assessment and the accounting, we, we can devise a series of applications in diverse social ecological settings to support certain decision making uh, applications. Uh, you've seen this already. So this is, uh, again, the, the China's National Ecosystem Assessment, which, as Steve mentioned, occurs every five years. Um, and then this is uh, the Qinghai GP example. And so these are really kind of built on top of each other. And then from there, uh, what's really exciting is in the past few years, you've seen a lot of applications. So the deployment of GEP on the ground. And what I wanna emphasize here is that, you know, contrary to a, the conventional view or a stereotype perhaps or a cliche about the way that China pursues development and its governance system is that it's all top down. Um, but with GEP, what we've seen is that it's actually uh, part of this uh, grassroots process of developing GEP in a variety of different settings, and then taking the best practices and the lessons learned, and then trying to scale them up. This is uh, an example of what's called the Two Mountains Bank, and these have been popping up all over the country in the past few years. And that's, uh, as you can see, it looks very much like a normal bank. It operates very much like a normal bank. You go inside and you sit well, okay, maybe not all banks. If you're an investor at uh, Silicon Valley Bank, perhaps um, you have a different experience these days. But, that, but like most uh, functioning banks, um, you know, you go in. If, if, but the, the 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 difference is that at, at the Two Mountains banks, it's specifically focused to the towards promoting GEP. So in jurisdictions, in local jurisdictions in, in China, like Shenzhen, which I showed, um, where GEP has become an official policy these banks are meant to support green finance. And so they give out loans at a subsidized, a very favorable rate for projects such as ecotourism or ecological restoration projects that promote GEP. And so this is just uh, one example of an application of GEP. And there's also um, things like these things called Two Mountains Companies, which are developed by rural uh, communes. So land is communally, the rural land is communally owned in China. And these Two Mountains Companies, they purchase uh, ecosystem services, um, and then the local villagers. Uh, so it's it's become a, a there's emerging kind of this organic, um, with the support of public private partnerships, this kind of commercial community revolved around GEP. And so this is really exciting to see some of these grassroots developments. And then in the city of Shenzhen, and I want to acknowledge this Professor Ouyang and Professor Han. These are our close collaborators at the Research Center for Eco Environmental Sciences. We've been really driving this process forward. This is the application of, Shen, of GEP in Shenzhen. So what you're seeing here, the, this is like the GEP, Shenzhen GEP portal. And Shenzhen has actually been calculating GEP since about 2014, 2015. And they've slowly developed the experience and uh, uh, developed institutional infrastructure to really deploy GEP across the whole city now. And so what happens is every government department has to contribute data to the Shenzhen GEP platform. And they can calculate it uh, at a very kind of granular level to look at how the, the value of GEP is distributed across the city. But very interestingly, it also breaks down by district. So there's 11 municipal districts in Shenzhen. And at the end of every year, um, previously had been that if you're a local administrator, you have to make sure that you hit your GDP target, you have to indicate GDP growth, that's how your performance is assessed. But now you have to also report GEP, so gross ecosystem products. So so this is a really uh, innovative policy application to hold local administrators responsible for investing in natural capital. Um, so this has been a very exciting development. And um, 
I think we're going to see more uh, further refinements of, of GDP in Shenzhen, for instance, by including, they're very interested in including aspects of mental health as part of the GDP, um, physical health. So I think GDP in Shenzhen is really at the cutting edge of, of an application of natural capital, uh, of a natural capital strategy. And in uh, October of last year, the, the central government, um, the National Development and Reform Commission, which is the central economic planner, it came out with this uh, national guidelines for GDP accounting. It really builds upon the lessons that were learned in places like Shenzhen, uh, in Lishui, which is in Zhejiang province, and a lot, a lot of other places that we've worked in. And I always tell people that even if you don't read Chinese, and you're looking at an official government document, you can tell that it's important because the, the cover, the letters are in red. And that's how you can tell it's a really important document. <laughs> if, you, if you get a document and then it's in the covers in black ink, you're like, okay, this, this is, it might be important, but you know, give me the red ink documents. <laughs> um, and now you're seeing GP deployed all over all over China, but this is this is just a subselection. So these are a lot of the, the, the places where we've actually, uh, in collaboration with the Chinese Academy of Sciences, have worked in China on a variety of applications. So using GDP to do eco to, de to design eco compensation, which is like payments for ecosystem services, to do uh, land zoning to incentivize ecosystem restoration. Um, and I think in the in the years to come, um, you know, especially with this national accounting guidelines. Mm -hmm. um, the application of GDP is just going to, um, you know, increase by an order of magnitude, and the demand for, um, for instance, for invest and for these the art, the software and the and the methods to calculate GDP is going to increase as well. And so we're also seeing GDP being picked up internationally, and so this is just a selection of kind of English language media coverage of gross ecosystem projects over the past couple of years, um, and especially you can see how. Uh, you know, places like Pakistan. So, so this is an article discussing how Pakistan can recover from its devastating floods last year. And they really identify a gross ecosystem product as an indicator that can guide their green and, and a more sustainable recovery. So this is also really exciting. And then finally, um, I want to you know, really give a shout out to the Anthropocene. Is it laboratory or is it a laboratory? Uh, <laughs> The, the Anthropocene Lab here at the, the Royal Society. I think this is, you know, GEP is very much in the spirit of this, this endeavor, um, you know, by identifying ecosystems as, you know, the sources of prosperity, security, and health, GEP incentivizes the revitalization of nature. And in this age of unprecedented change, GEP can help humanity reconnect to the biosphere. I think that's really crucial because, you know, Steve in his presentation, he showed that this kind of monomaniacal focus on GDP at all costs has kind of taken us, has severed a lot of our connections from the biospheres. Hopefully we can use GEP to bind us back to this, uh, to the natural systems upon which we all depend. Um, so that's the, uh, that's my presentation. Thank you. Okay. Thanks a lot. So my name is Frederick Mulberry. I'm working both for the Stockholm Resilience Center and Alba Eco, two of the organizers. I'm so happy that the Stockholm seminars have kicked off again. I just promised Carl to help moderate the Q&A session. So if Steve, Gretchen, and uh, <laughs> Pong as well come up here and see if we have questions both here from the audience in the, the near hall. And if there is someone online, asking a question as well. Uh, Luis will help read them. So please, thanks again. Give them a round of applause. <laughs> so we see, is this, can you guys hear me now online, please? Yeah, it is good. So any questions here in the room, please raise your hand and tell us who you are. Try to be brief and have a clear question. <laughs> <laughs> I stay here first. Yeah, so you get to this. this. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Frederick. So I'm Gary Sweet. I'm a professor at Stockholm Resilience Center and also the director of FinBio, which is uh, uh, which is also one of the uh, promoters of this talk. It's really great stuff. I, I read a paper about uh, GEP in China at the end of last year that was talking about 
that people have really done it differently in different places, which you also mentioned. But I was wondering if you could maybe talk about the differences between how people have done it and what maybe some of the pros and cons of different approaches as people been doing it. So obviously I presume doing it in a more rural place and will present different challenges and opportunities in Shen Center. So just about something about how it's been used differently in China and maybe what the national standards mean will that all converge while keeping different. So thanks. Um, can I tell a joke? <laughs> so I, joke. So I, I was trained as an environmental economist and uh, there's this joke that says, um, you know, environmental economists, uh, they don't really care about saving the environment. They just want to plot the optimal trajectory to environmental destruction. <laughs> um, so I guess the sort of the, the commonality of how GEP has been applied is uh, it's, it's meant to really incent, whether it's in Shenzhen, it's in the highly uh, affluent urban area, whether it's in a more rural, um, underdeveloped area, it's meant to incentivize investment in natural capital. So in a place like Shenzhen, which is not short on money, I mean, they have a lot of money to spend, as you can tell by that really kind of fancy looking internet interface. There's talk about launching our own satellite to collect, you know, like more regular information for, for GP, like a GP satellite. Um, so they're not really hurting for money. And so there they can develop really cutting edge applications of GEP in terms of, for instance, the mental health and physical health approaches that I mentioned. Now, applying GEP in a place uh, in a more rural area that's more economically underdeveloped, uh, there GEP is used more to generate this kind of, like those two mountains banks examples, they're more to generate rural income and employment opportunities without destroying the natural capital base. And then over the long run, incentivizing the local land stewards to continue investing in natural capital as a means for more income and employment opportunities. One of the, you know, one of the defining features of Chinese society going now and going forward is urbanization. And so the rural, the countryside has been really left behind. And a lot of these villages are what we call them hollow villages because it's you have the, the left behind kids and the elderly because all the working age, a lot of the working age people have migrated to the cities. And in places like that, ecotourism actually could be a really uh, beneficial, uh, a new way and a plausible way for the, the, the village communities to continue to, to generate new sources of income without having to destroy their environment. Um, and so I think, uh, and in, for, also in, in more uh, agricultural regions, you know, GEP, a lot of GEP is going to be taken up by the material services. And so trying to develop agricultural production in a more ecologically sound way. Uh, while also protecting biodiversity. So I guess those are just some of the more kind of stylized examples of how GEP is being used. i just add one, one thing. So, um, uh, so not only in China, but elsewhere. And so, you know, the UN has been very interested in developing, you know, their system of environmental economic accounts. And, and you know, there um, the pressure is uniformity. Like we want to have everybody report the same standard, which I understand for accounting purposes. Um, I think one of the things that 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 Tong's talk and in general in China have, have emphasized is um, this approach, you know, broadly, you know, stuff that you're doing, the stuff of GEP, this is about making financial systems and economic systems actually have an accurate reflection of the contributions of, of nature. So in the broader sense, not just the accounting sense, but the broader sense, I think there's a lot of room for not having it uh, regimented and and you know having having it be different in different places. But you know, for the accounting world, they're they're going to want the standard set of accounts done everywhere. All right, we start here. I know you're next, Anne Sophie. Hope you, hope they Thank can you. Hear online. I think I'm Anne Sophie Crepin, the Bay Deputy Director of the Bay Institute. Uh, I was wondering, Steve, in your presentation, you mentioned the aggregation of these different GEP or GDP products. And I know from my background in economics that aggregating these values in GDP is not straightforward or well, you transfer everything in money. Is it how it's done as well in GP? And what are the caveats of that? Yeah, so um, it, it, exactly. So everything in the GEP is, in fact, converted into money. So you've got the same monetary metrics. Um, 
you do have to, just as in GDP accounting, you have to make sure that you're both counting everything at least once and not counting it more than once, right? Um, so some of these things, you know, for example, um, many things which are important in GEP actually already show up in GDP, but, but the way they show up in GDP, the contribution of nature is hidden, right? So we report the value of agricultural crops. But what goes into the crops? Well, of course, it's pollinators, it's water supply, it's the quality of the soil. So one of the actual advantages of GDP, excuse me, GEP, is it breaks out the contributions of nature that go into those things that actually already are counted in GDP. But then, as I said, you can't count the value of the pollinators and the value of the crops because you're actually counting the, the same thing. So you do have to be careful in in your accounting so that you really are being fair, counting everything, trying to get everything be inclusive. So count it once, but not more than once. But it's the same, a lot of the same issues as in, in GDP accounting. I'll jump in if you don't mind. I'll just add a couple of things to that really good question and to the one preceding it. It's, um, you know, we all know that GDP as a system took a long time to come into being and really be standardized. So we can expect the same to play out here. We're trying to offer a lot of science support and um, practical implementation support. Um, so we know that we're really secondly estimating kind of lower bound values of nature. Nobody's saying GP encapsulates all the values. It's really getting it a lower bound set. And maybe as we improve over time and measuring things such as um, mental health benefits and other sort of physical health. And obviously we're all one thing is <laughs> very synergistic, the different dimensions of health. Um, that's a key research frontier that we will bring into GEP when it kind of makes sense, but that could be enormous and um, have huge implications, especially in mega cities where people have such limited experience of nature. And then the third and final thing I was going to mention, playing off of both questions, is that um, countries can adopt, you know, a subset of this. China's had a couple of decades of experience with these types of um, both modeling and institutional mechanisms, designing new policies such as the sloping land conversion program, which followed, you know, devastating flooding in 1998, um, and is now the largest. PES scheme in the world and you know still operates that way. This is brand new to a lot of countries. So um, in some places like in Colombia, we're really starting with the water accounts. You can easily develop you know, a subset of the whole system and kind of prove out its use and build um, kind of confidence in the approach and develop some new policy angles and things like that. And then bring in other stuff. But really great questions, looking forward to more. You can get to comments first here. <laughs> okay, so uh, call for from here. <laughs> uh, I'm happy to be inside, not outside. But anyhow, I was wondering about the uh, 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 the quality dimension of the natural capital. So uh, how, how are you thinking about that and how it could be de further developed? The whole the whole idea, for example, Gretchen mentioned how there's new floodings going on in, in California and then you will have probably fires in the summer and things like that. Is, is it possible in this type of measurements today to capture sort of the, the capacity of certain parts of the land to deal with some of these shocks. For example, is it some uh, way to capture some diversity measures or see whether whether the forests are only monocultures that would be fragile to pests and things like that? How do you look how do you look at that dimension? Sure. Okay. That is a key frontier, I would say. Um, so there's a widespread recognition that ecosystem quality and all these dimensions of quality are really important and they're often hidden in these more simplified approaches. Um, so right now I'd say we're still at a relatively simplified um, system. 
the ecosystem quality will be revealed in some of the remote sensing and we could based on data and knowledge today of the importance of let's say forest type we could capture that readily in some of the modeling but for many of the um, benefits that we're talking about it's not that well known um, or that um, how quality affects you know different metrics of quality would affect um, the stability and reliability and supply of the benefit flow um, and then similarly there are a lot of things that are quite difficult to measure on a large scale and rapidly through time, such as through remote sensing methods. That's where um, these ground truthing systems in China with the 140,000 sites, they're not only trying to match to satellite um, based information or derived information, but also just trying to track with more direct measures. So I think a key frontier and actually one that would be yeah, great to be collaborating on would involve ecosystem quality and maybe picking a few key foci where we know we could uh, deploy a more advanced approach based on knowledge we mostly have in hand today, um, and especially accounting for resilience. Um, so you, you really hit on a key key point. Maybe these guys have a, any further thing you want to add? Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, one of the things that um, I find really interesting is the, I mean, GEP, for the most part, is capturing what's happening today. Like, here's the flow of the goods and services that we observe. But of course, what you, you know, a lot of what you want to know is what is the value of preserving or enhancing the natural capital for the future flow of goods and services, right? And so there... Um, I think we're we're less in the accounting world and more in the policy or planning world. And there, I think there's a lot of um, room for bringing in, you know, some of the resilient science and thinking about the system dynamics. That that right now, as Gretchen uh, said, I I think a lot of what the accounting world does right now is based on what do we observe right now, but not what we expect to have happen. But of course a lot of the value of maintaining the systems is uh, for, for what's happening in the future. So I, just as Gretchen said, I think there's a lot of room for, for development there. I, and you know, personally, I'm more interested in that kind of science than I am in the simple accounting for today, but there's a lot of demand for the accounting today. So, yeah. It's, uh, I was, they said it was exactly what I would wanted to say. <laughs> it's good, it's good. Thanks. <laughs> of course, we're extremely interested in that sort of the resilience value of ecosystems, the insurance value, biodiversity, and things like that. So, really nice to hear your thoughts on that. I know we have two more questions in the room, but I'm actually going to take one from the internet. Louise. Thank you. Yeah, we got several questions here, but we start with one. For anyone, where do you see a role for new technology in the spread and adoption of uh, GEP from Lindsay Higgins? I guess it relates a bit to what you just said. I'll jump in with you. I'll throw one idea out. I'm sure there, there are many key frontiers here, but it actually relates to this ecosystem quality question and the ability um, to report in a reliable, repeatable way that doesn't cost very much and is pretty quick to learn or distribute aspects of ecosystem quality. And one thing we've seen emerge is on cell phones, these LIDAR types of apps that let you um, capture in really fine detail vegetation sort of volume or mass and structure, and also even potentially diversity of plant species and types. Um, so we're seeing that used now among small landholders to report increase or changes in carbon above ground carbon stocks and being deployed even in this voluntary carbon market world um, in a way that incentivizes and you know pays um, smallholder farmers, ranchers and and such for increases in carbon. So that's one example. And I was just trying it out myself actually in Costa Rica last month. And it, it's really pretty amazing stuff that 
it would have involved just mind numbing for you know grad student work to spend a few months out here by yourself um quantifying this complex of tangled you know semi-jungle vegetation out in the farmland can be done in a few minutes and then then the poor grad student can sit and analyze the data um, <laughs> by themselves for a long time but that's one example that could really um i think a lot of um value valuable information can come from something like that and we're seeing um new reporting schemes coming along for biodiversity too where certain iconic species can be captured by photo and um, immediately kind of sent by satellite to report on um, the, say, nature positivity of farming practices in coffee in Costa Rica. This is being done and, and things like that. Um, I'll, I'll let the others, I'm taking words out of their mouth, I'm sure. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I have no excuses. Um, I think one, and again, this is not my field, so I probably I'm stepping out of my lane, but um, I think machine learning is going to be a big part of calculating GEP, making it, improving the accuracy of our estimates and assessments, and also um, making the process less labor intensive. Um, so making grad students lazier and lazier. Uh, <laughs> Um, and I think that will also be able to, that'll make um, GEP uh, more accessible to um, a broader range of communities and countries. And so for those data poor regions or for those regions where you can't be like Shenzhen and really deploy a lot of personnel and, and human resources towards calculating GEP, I think you know, automation and, and machine learning will help make that a bit easier in the future. We took all of Steve's work. Yeah, we set it all <laughs> Okay. 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 Yeah. Thank you. Um, I understand both uh, with regard to the presentations. Uno Svedin. A retired professor, Stockholm University. Um, I understand that the wiggling questions and uh, also the presentations are zooming in on my question also, which has to do with the uh, value formation, the formation of value. I was a little helped by one of the answers and I quote here in the presentation of the responses and then bring in the other stuff, end of quote. I thought that was a jolly interesting comment. <laughs> and uh, my question deals with just that. Uh, it has to do with, let's say, different types of natural phenomena. Let's keep them sort of value-free as phenomenon until they are lifted in into the metrics. And uh, I have brought some uh, from the presentations. The value of uh, certain plants, different plants have different types of uh, values in different types of ecosystems. Uh, the sandstorm modification that we heard from the Chinese example, uh, and uh, also coming back to the pollinators. So here we have three juicy cases. And uh, the question then is, how is this and this other stuff building up, obviously, in a sort of sequence of additions of different kinds of value formation, because they are very different. So uh, it could also be so that the process then might be different for the value formation of any of these different the sandstorms uh, are differently treated than the pollinators, if I say so. And so my question goes in how to handle the summation and the classification of the elements of the values building up the sum. Who wants to start? Yeah, I'll start. Um, uh, so no, it's a, it's a great question. And, and part of the reason, um, you know, 
So GEP actually, like GDP, it forces you to put everything into a common metric, a monetary metric. Um, and so that monetary metric is, is meant to represent what is the value of the service, like if it were being, so in GDP, it's all bought and sold in the market. So it's market value. So they don't have the kinds of questions that we do in GEP, because many of the things like sandstorms and pollinators, I'll stick with those two for the moment. Um, okay, so let's walk through how, how did we value each of each of those uh, contributions. So the I'll start with the pollinators, which is uh, perhaps a slightly easier story. So with the pollinators, the, the first part of this is work that Gretchen and colleagues and uh, many ecologists have done is building up, like um, when you have pollinators present, like what is the contribution to the increase in the quantity or the quality of various kinds of crops? So the hard work actually is the work that Gretchen does, is figuring out, what is it that the pollinators are doing? How do they change the quantity of the crop, the quality of the crop? The economic part of it is fairly easy because we do sell most of these crops uh, and they have a market value. So we can figure out, okay, well, if I've grown twice as, you know, if I, I have twice as many apple orchards as I would have had without this, if we'd had to hand pollinate, I, I can figure out what the value of that increase in the apple supply is. So so on the pollinators, it's actually contributing to a marketed good, which we can then value using market prices. So you've got to have the natural capital, which is the habitat for the pollinators to be present. So and, and uh, Gretchen, so delay the delay that part of the question. Gretchen is much more able to answer that part than I am. Um, uh, on the sandstorms, what did we do? So the sandstorms actually are a contributor to air pollution. Um, and air pollution is, is um, you know, if you look at uh, Lancet type studies, it is the largest environmental contributor to premature mortality uh, and, and morbidity. So um, there's a huge health component uh, to air pollution. So here, what we do is we, we calculate um, you know, if you maintain the habitat, if you um, don't have as much dust blowing into the air, um, you know, so you prevented the sandstorm, that leads to improved air quality. Given the prevailing winds, who's downwind from that? What's the lower exposure to that uh, air, you know, to, to the sand, to the dust? Um, and then using uh, epidemiological models, how does that translate into fewer uh, mortalities less sickness. And then there are people who, you know, in that field, there's a value of statistical life, a value of preventing illness. And that's what we apply to convert that then into a, a monetary term. But you're exactly right that each of these, and this is what kind of makes the field, well, you could say interesting or challenging, is that you really have to have this sort of detailed approach for saying, how is it that nature is contributing? So the pollinators are contributing because they're contributing to productivity of agriculture. The sandstorm prevention is contributing to a public health dimension. Um, so figuring out exactly how is it that nature is contributing in what ways, then that leads to how do we figure out both the quantification of the service and the, the valuation um, of the service. I don't know if you want to talk more about pollinators. Sure, I'll talk. Want to hear more about pollinators? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> you don't look very sure. <laughs> I'll tell you a little more and we'll see how that goes. Um, yeah, I nearly um, went blind and re lost the ability to walk when working on your question about pollinators, even though there was a young postdoc who was doing most of the work, um, Taylor Ricketts. The bottom line, I think, is that um, what we're reaching for is a way of addressing the immediate crisis with this developing this system, deploying some metrics that might serve as a kind of attractors that help drive further innovation, like Tong was um, describing for China um, down at the village level with the emergence of these banks and just all kinds of people suddenly seeing a way to connect their business with investing in and nurturing nature and reconnecting with nature. 
But over the long run, we need a much deeper shift that will involve much more than GEP and such. That's my main answer. But on pollinators, I'd say um, it's a good arena to understand you know, how much we don't know. So it was about 20 years ago now, we went out into coffee plantations in Costa Rica. They tend to be quite well managed and um, by conventional standards. And we were looking for pollinators and guess how many different types of bee you find flying around sipping nectar from coffee flowers in one month of um, checking how many types of bee, different species. Does anybody want to make a guess? 20. Okay, I'm going to say a little higher. Anybody want to make another guess? <laughs> Quickly and you'll win a prize. 52. Okay, you guys, <laughs> we're too much in the snowstorm here. Um, so about seven to 800 types of bee in one small, less than a hectare um, farm and, that, and telling them apart. We are not sure how they tell each other apart, but... <laughs> um, we tell them apart by like the hairs popping out of their forehead. You know, some of them have bigger eyebrows and spiky things coming off of their forehead than others, that kind of thing. So it's incredibly complex and it's very humbling actually to see how little we know about what's going on. And some of those bees are known um, to need thousands of trips between the um, existing colony uh, to a new, you know, to kind of birth a new colony to establish that one, uh, next colony. So you would need habitat enabling those trips to take place. And they're, they're not going to cross, you know, farming deserts. Um, so there's so many uh, mysteries still to our many interconnections with nature. And I feel the pollinator case is one that really illuminates those for us and um, the little the substitute we have from Italy in the north in the American context from north through to South America of the Apis mellifera you know is not doing its job anymore being wiped out because it's so uniform so susceptible not resilient you know to these different um, pathogens that are attacking it and we really need ever more the diversity of native pollinators that can be shockingly high and um, still mostly beyond even our imagination. So thanks for your good question. <laughs> thanks, Gretchen. Definitely remember your studies on coffee and pollination. I like both, both coffee and pollinators. <laughs> and talking about a clear case and sort of the need for functional diversity. Thanks for telling us the story. Luis, anything more from the internet? Our Zoomers are are very uh, interested as well. And we had over 80 people following, just had to say that. Uh, so listen, thanks, listen, Schultz, she thanks for great presentations and asks this. You explained that both GEP and GDP only measure flows. Based on your experience, how do you envision that assets and stocks could be measured for sustainability? Um, yeah, um, as, as I said, you know, if, if you really want to talk about sustainable development, um, not just what's happening today, then you you need you need the measure of the stocks, you need the measure of wealth, and uh, you know Carl's question also about um, you know thinking about the contribution not just to today, but you know the resilience and the um, you know maintaining uh, maintaining the flows. Um, we have ways of. Okay, so on the biophysical side, I think we're, we're in some ways much better off than on the valuation, you know, putting things into monetary terms. In fact, the book that I, I talked about at the very beginning, the, the, the Going Beyond GDP, the, the mismeasurement uh, book from, uh, from, that was sponsored by the French government, um, they basically said, you know, it's probably too ambitious to come up with a single metric of of the values of the stocks um you know it's like how do we actually measure the resilience values of ecosystems and so forth so um so so there's one school of thought that says 
um, we can measure things, uh, at, at least, you know, we, we can get towards measurements of, of stocks, kind of the amount and the quality or the characteristics of the stock. We can do that in biophysical terms. It will be harder to then aggregate that and say, what's the value of those in monetary terms? So um, we concentrated uh, right now on the, on the flows side for the valuation side. Um, you know, a lot of work both in China and elsewhere has actually done good, really good work on quantifying the, the stocks, not in monetary terms, but just in, you know, like what's the amount of forest, for example, what's the quality of the forest or of grasslands? Um, how much bio, you know, how are species doing? So many of the, the there are stock measures, but they're not um, typically not measured in dollar terms. Um, even in conventional economics kind of struggles with valuing capital stocks. I mean, if you looked at measures that are that are reported in government statistics on just produced capital, there are simple depreciation terms that are used, which don't actually match with what's going on with the productivity of, of the stock. So I think that's still a challenge of measuring stock, you know, coming up with the monetary measure of stocks in the way that GEP tries to capture the monetary values of the flows of ecosystem services. So. Um, well, I can't improve on Steve's answer from a scientific standpoint, but uh, maybe I'll, I'll have a, a general. You can make it funnier. <laughs> yeah. Well, see, that's what I'm here for. <laughs> Uh, and maybe this this also touches upon the previous question, which is that I think I was speaking to someone about introducing GEP and tell them about these two mountains banks and, and Shenzhen and all this good stuff. And, and he was an economist and he said, well, you know, Colin, this, it sounds like it all works in practice, but the more, more important question is, does it work in theory? <laughs> he says, no economist ever won Nobel Prize just by proving it works in practice. Let's see some differential equations. Um, but I think that the point is that is that you know we see these these grassroots efforts, these experiments, and these innovations, and it's encouraging because I think we are in a kind of a triage moment, and and you know the sense of urgency is such that I think just seeing advances on the ground is is uh, you know we know these are imperfect measures. GEP isn't meant to be used alone, and I also hasten to add I think if you're talking to you know policymakers and stakeholders, it's not meant to act, displace GDP. It is not a replacement for GDP, <laughs> but it's one more uh, tool in our toolkit. And I think in these kind of urgent times, it's going to be a very useful tool. And, you know, in the long run, um, maybe the goal would be something like an Ostrom-like approach of going around and seeing the, the places where GP has worked in these different contexts, and then arriving at kind of more general principles about what it is that makes it work, a general theory but I think right now we're just at the beginning stages of of this application and I think um, you know we're going to see a lot of advances and uh, more nuanced understandings of it in the future so I'll give a perfect follow-up question to to this tongue because Lars Root asks what will it take for GP to replace GDP uh, is there a political process in place and what is a realistic timeline for this to happen um well, I guess the short answer would be, I don't think it'll ever replace G, uh, GDP. Um, it'll, I think, help augment, complement, discipline, perhaps GD, uh, GDP a bit more. But, um, and I think it's it's um, it's like, a, <laughs> I'll have all these terrible analogies about what, G, what the relationship between GDP and GDP, but it's like, I guess one of my less bad ones would be, um, <laughs> would be, uh, would be is, is uh you know if 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 GDP you know GDP has you know despite our kind of critiques and these very justifiable critiques of GDP it's actually been not just influential but it's actually delivered I would say some positive social economic results over the past you know near century that it's been used, um, but uh, GDP is also kind of like you know this really good friend you have but who's had a little too much to drink at the party you know he's gone from being fun to being uh, a bit irritating he's ruining the party for everyone. And uh, and so GDP is the sober friend that you get to drive them home, you know, like take away the keys and, and get GDP home, you know. Uh, GDP 
sober up. We've had too much to drink. Um, so it, it's been used kind of in alongside GDP and not instead of G, GDP, I would say. But I think it is important that I don't think that would diminish the importance of or the innovation of GDP because, you know, in a, in areas in China and many other places where the local administrator, these policymakers are under extreme pressure to deliver economic results, uh, to deliver development, you know, the difference uh, between something that's kind of priceless, nature that's priceless, and something that's worthless to them is a very thin line. And I think GEP helps really darken, bolden that line and draw the line, you know, to make that distinction and say, you know, like, uh, you know, these, these ecosystem assets, this natural capital is valuable, and it can be a foundation for you to improve the, the livelihoods of the people that's, uh, you know, within your jurisdiction. So I think in that respect, it's going to be um, a you know, it's a very great contribution to sustainable development, even if it doesn't replace GDP. All right. I have a few questions now in the room, people physically present here. So, please. Thank you. Um, so, my name is Dario Piserli. I work for the European Environment Agency in Copenhagen. Um, so, my uh, I have two very small questions. One really builds upon um, what you were just discussing, which is um, the fact that I guess the point is not whether GDP will ever replace GDP, but it's the value in contributing to specific, I guess, policy debates, some of which are very timely, of course, think about, yeah, food security or One Health, sort of the, you know, the link between environmental degradation and emergence of the seas. And I was curious, of course, you know, there are many issues there with measurements, you know, how you come up with, especially the, you know, the, the, the contribution of, of ecosystem to long-term, you know, natural pest control and food security and so on, as opposed to current use of pesticides uh, in maintaining crop yields. But I was curious whether in practice, uh, this type of framing around food security, for example, has been used in some of the existing projects um, to highlight the value of, of, the, of the GP. And um, the second question was in relation to, um, to health and health measuring health benefits, because this is more of what I work with at the, at the EA. And um, I guess one of the main issues is with the availability of health data in Europe, right? Kind of having a uh, um, EU-wide assessment of the benefits of of, um, of a healthy environment to to, to human health uh, is is quite hard because you don't have that kind of geospatial data available. And I was wondering if that's the case, for example, in some of the projects in China, how how that has been done. Those are fantastic questions. I'll take a pass at um, the first part on food security. Um, predating GEP, which again, and we only published in 2020, um, there's been a building uh, body of scientific work um, showing using this general framework, you know, how much sort of biodiversity or quote native or semi-natural habitat um, is really needed to support food security long-term and even sh short-term in places. Claire Kremen, and there, there's a huge group of people um, leading this work and generally showing that at least, you know, something like 20% of a landscape in semi-natural or natural condition is um, extremely productive, you know, and enhances um, short and also especially longer term productivity, obviously varying by system. And that's my own personal and more limited experience working in the tropics um, for many different types of benefits, whether it's, you know, in any elements of nature in a landscape devoted mostly to agriculture, um, where nature is really scarce, you know, they have extremely high value <clears throat> and a lot will hinge in terms of water quality in terms of global climate security through carbon sequestration and also just shading, many places are becoming just over the threshold of heat and solar insulation that um, maintains past levels of productivity. Um, so just the shading is becoming a bigger deal, not only for animals, but for many crops. Wind breaks, like as wind conditions change, California is experiencing really extreme winds this year. and um, it's having incredible effects on a lot of different things, including in agriculture. Um, similarly with pollinators, with natural pest control, with 
um, many other benefits that come from having nature integrated throughout farming systems, water quality affecting um, irrigation, as well as other sort of more downstream benefits. Um, so anyway, it goes back to that literature showing roughly 20%. And, and that's where there is a thrust to move um, into policy and implementation, but not yet as far as I know in GEP, though I know in China, I don't know if you want to say anything, um, the intensive agriculture is kind of the next focus that's underway because it is um, such a devastating set of practices with respect to where we need to head now in the Anthropocene. I guess just <clears throat> to comment briefly on the, the Chinese example, yeah, I mean, food security is uh, really one of the top national policy agendas. I mean, you know, if you, I think it would be difficult for any American or, or European person to, you know, to know what the annual yield of, of their cereal crops are every year, but a lot of Chinese people follow that because you know, the, it's like, what's the rice yield this year? What's the wheat? Because it's the, that's really important now. National, you know, food security is a form of economic security is a form of health security. But of course, China is, it has 1.4 billion people, though it's a large country, but, you know, has less arable land than India, which is, you know, one third of the size in terms of, the, the, you know, the area of the, the coverage, spatial coverage. Um, and so intensive agriculture, sustainable agricultural, ag you know, sustainable agricultural intensification is really important. But how do we, um, Kind of combine that with ecological restoration and protection. I think that's a really that's a frontier of research and policy. And uh, um, you know, our colleagues, Professor Ouyang, uh, chief among them at the Chinese Academy of Sciences, have been leading a lot of research programs looking at how we do that. How do we do this spatial ecological planning at a large scale that also combines food security and agricultural production? Um, so yeah, I think that's that's a very important topic. You want to go with that? Yeah, uh, yeah just. Um... So um, I'm going to actually try to link uh, food and health. We, we've been doing some work on um, uh, the air pollution consequences of agriculture. Um, and, you know, it, it, there's a lot when you put nitrogen on fields. Unfortunately, not all of it stays in the place where you want it. Some of it uh, volatilizes and contributes to formation downwind of particulate matter, which is key um, negative health uh, consequence. And so um, in, in the American Midwest, for example, um, the negative damages through local air pollution, as far as we've been able to calculate, are probably the single largest damage, um, uh, you know, more than the carbon consequences, uh, greenhouse gases, more than the water consequences. So, uh, which is surprising, especially in the American Midwest, because there are huge water quality consequences as well. Um, so, um, you know, they're clearly, you know, so the question then is, well, we have to, we have to grow food. We have to have food security. How do we grow, how do we grow food in ways that are less environmentally destructive, right? And so that's the key question. And, and so a lot of analysis that we and others have been doing is like, where and how do you grow food in a way that provides food security, but does so in a way that also maintains or enhances the, the flows of these other ecosystem services. Um, I also just like to say though, that, um, you know, as Gretchen has been emphasizing too, there is a lot that we don't know. Um, and so I think, um, you know, 20 years from now, I hope that people look back on the work that we did and we go, well, that was that was nice first step, but that was really crude. There, there are lots of things that we need to be adding uh, into this. Um, I think the the health linkages, um, I think the air pollution stuff is, is, is fairly far along, but I think there are a lot of other health linkages, you know, work that Gretchen has been doing with colleagues on, on mental health, for example. And there, I think it is really hard to think about what is the, you know, what is it from nature that's contributing to mental health? And then do we have the set of data? Is it access to nature? Is it something else? And, and do we have the data to, to quantify that in a way that we could put into policy? I think we're, you know, there's several challenges still remaining to, to do that. Thanks a lot. I mean, we have quite a long uh, Q&A session. I love it. So we will continue for a while. I have three more questions from the room. And I know that Luis have a, at least a couple from the internet. So I give, I'll give the word to Luis first. And then I will give the word to Carl after all the questions to summarize everything. Carl, you ready? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so Monia Lundgren asks, tourists 
tourism is often situated along coastlines. Uh, does GEP consider oceanic systems and how would this fall out in ecotourism? Sure. I feel like inviting Mary Ruckel's house up here. Do you want to run up here? We should have a party, Mary. Come on up. <laughs> Okay, excellent. <laughs> Mary's led a lot of the work on this front. Yeah, hi, thanks for the question. The, the GEP approach is really transferable to any system and we've done a lot of the, the evaluation along coastlines work. Um, the, the pilots in China so far do not include coastal systems, but the, the approaches and our work in Colombia that Gretchen mentioned has a freshwater component and they're also very interested in the, the tourism values in particular because as we know many of the tourism values from ecosystems come from coral reefs, mangrove systems, and even seagrass systems that have fishery implications and coastal protection implications, a lot of the other valuable ecosystem assets along coastal systems. So yeah, thank you for the question. <laughs> Thanks. The thanks guess, a lot. The guess, thanks, thanks a lot. A big round of applause again for coming up from the audience. Thanks. All right. Now I will go to Elias. Uh, thank you so much for a very interesting topic and very interesting discussion. So my name is Therese Lindahl. I am a researcher here at the Bayer Institute in, in the house. Uh, so I was uh, I was wondering when I listened to why this sort of these measurements pick up and why is it so successful compared to other measurements of, for example, that we see you know, green accounting, so to speak. So there was this measurement called genuine savings, where you had this stock of, of capital, natural capital, and it should not decline over time. That's how you know it's, you're on the right track. And then I was thinking, you know, maybe these measurements of flow is actually pretty smart because it's it's and to have it on par with GDP, maybe that is sort of a, you know, good to to um, spur some attraction. But then uh, Steve, you said that well, actually, it's kind of difficult to measure uh, these stocks, and maybe this is why these measurements did not pick up. So then I had to reformulate my question. Uh, so now I'm wondering, so why do you think it is so successful, your measurement? Is it because the timing is right? Is it because you had this GDP, it's easy to sort of to get from policymakers? Is it that you have now the tools and the uh, yeah, the techniques, so to speak, with remote sensors to do these measurements? Why do you think it's has you had such good deployment of, of the method? So that is my question now. Thank you. I'll start with Frank. Okay. Um, I think you've partly answered the question. The time is right. I mean, you know, if we had been doing this 10 years ago, I don't think it would have been, the uptake would have been nearly as much. I mean, just, Gary knows this and others in the room know this, just within, for example, the last one to two to three years, the interest in the private sector has just skyrocketed. Um, I think the the interest amongst the, you know, national income and wealth accountants, a much smaller field, but um, that they also have, you know, the, the interest has been there, but I think I think it's matured to the point where they go, okay, yes, we, we need this. And so in fact, the the SIA environment, uh, e ecosystem accounts actually got formally put in as a statistical standard. And that just happened in the last two years. Um, and then GEP, you know, we had, as Gretchen said, we had a lot of exchange with the UN SIA folks. And what we were initially, I think they were viewing it, oh, there's this upstart from China that's, you know, not playing with the rest of it. And he said, no, no, this is actually, you can build this consistent with the UN SIA account. It's a summary measure. In fact, just like GDP is a summary measure of much of what goes on in the income accounts um, in the standard economic things. So, you know, I think it was something of, 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 of marketing and building on saying, you are already familiar with GDP. This is something that's similar, but is bringing in the environment, you know, the, the ecological side in a way that GDP does not. But I think a lot of it also is, you know, you already ticked off. It's like, we have remote sensing. We have a development of models that enable us to do better predictions um, and estimates. So I think it's a combination uh, of those things. And I and I hope your the premise of your question is right that we really are being successful. 
All right. Another question here from the audience. No. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Lan Bang Adamson, a researcher at Stockholm Resilience Center. Thank you so much for this uh, amazing presentation or amazing work. Um, it's really inspiring. Um, my question is, um, I was wondering if you could elaborate a little bit more on sort of the pitfalls or sort of kind of misuse resulting from misunderstanding if there is any that you already see happening or if you foresee. I guess my question comes a little bit from one of the few projects I've been working in China where there was sort of a development project of a quite untouched um, piece of mountain, like nature, very beautiful nature. And there was discussion was sort of if we build a cable car right through this mountain, um, it would benefit the ecotourists um, so that people actually come to learn and come in touch with this nature. But by building the cable car in itself also intervenes with the, yeah, the, the untouched nature in itself with the risk that it means. So, so but uh, the, the argument was there that by building something there, you enhance the ecosystem service, but you also, yeah, reduce the natural value of the nature. So I was thinking if you could elaborate a little bit of more of this kind of trade-offs or contrasting ways of valuing things. Thanks. Do you have any bad jokes? <laughs> 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 you, you have, I'll, 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 I'll dive in, but then, yeah. I think that's a great question. So I worry about this a lot. You know, whenever you're creating a new tool, you know, you you create. Uh, actually, at breakfast this morning, we were talking about the the techies and the AI and and you know the people actually before then who were promoting the internet, and they said, you know, this is just going to be wonderful for humanity. And now you think about all of the the negatives of social media and the worries about AI. So I think it behooves us to be thinking all the way along about how can this be misused or misinterpreted in harmful ways. The, the, the example that you gave on the, the, the cable car, or the you know, I, I think there it comes back to um, actually a question Carl answer, asked earlier, but tying this to um, measures of stocks of natural capital. So yes, maybe it's increasing the flow of ecotourism right now, but what is it doing in the long term, both to the value of ecotourism, perhaps, if you're kind of degrading the, the environment in the area, but also to other ecosystem services uh, in the area, you know, is, and so what is the overall contribution, not just to ecotourism, but to the range of things and how will that change into the future? So I think we can guard against some of that by incorporating impacts on natural capital, the stocks, so not just focus on the flows, but also have measures of stocks. Um, but um, what, what I've seen in, in work, uh, um, like I spent a year at the Council of Economic Advisors in the U.S., and, and they are, you know, if, if you have numbers and they line up with the politics, they will be used, but not always in the way that you want them to be used. Um, and these are, I think this is a set of numbers that, um, that governments will find useful, but maybe not always in the way that we would want them to be applied. And there, there, you know, you can try to um, insist on certain standards uh, of use, but um, right now there, there isn't like a set of standards uh, for this. Um, so it, there, there is potential for both positive use, and hopefully that outweighs it. But I think it behooves all of us to be thinking about how can we guard against maybe some of the misuses um, of this. So it's a great question. Gretchen, Tong, you want to add anything or? Yeah, yeah, yeah I, I completely agree. I think it's it's also you know we need to be very cautious. You know, it's um, it's still in its infancy, as Gretchen mentioned, and you know, sim as, you know, same with GDP. You know, we have labor standards now that weren't in place. If we got rid of those labor standards, <laughs> GDP would probably increase. But there's no civilized country that would consider removing laws in child labor or workers' health and safety, right? And so. You know, with the cable car example, I think that's, you know, that cases like that should be considered, you know, should we count that something like that in GEP? Or did, is it a violation of um, kind of more ethical social standards? Uh, so we shouldn't include that. So I think these are these are questions that will continue and should be asked. And I think, um, you know, like GDP, like any other indicator, the, the system of regulations um, and other standards are going to evolve along with this, along with GDP as it becomes more applied.
I'm going to add one thing that's more personal, but, uh, you know, reinforcing what they're saying. Um, so when did you move to Stockholm, Steve? 2008, 2009. Okay, so Steve moved here in 0809 and it was just euphoric. <laughs> and um, so my partner and I got the idea of moving here as well. <laughs> it took a little while, but Kyler was wonderful to invite us. And, um, you know, we initially with my partner, he didn't know Sweden well. And um, so he's naming all these other places. But what was so attractive here is obviously this community for me, but what really enticed him and also me was the idea of the, um, like the beauty of Sweden, things that you really don't find in some of like the rest of Europe where we could have gone, my partner's from the UK and where every square inch has got the equivalent of a cable car or some access route through it and the, the natural more wildness is is mostly gone apart from maybe far up north and um what it comes to in the end is that it's our values and how we promote them in our cultures and um, through our institutions in and then you know what economic and other drivers are at play you know that that threaten realizing what we might all share at some level as core values but where um they're going to be all these pressures and how do we how do we keep cultivating the sense of some of these values that are really hard to um, capture in the way so much of our decisions are made today and I don't know that GP is being designed to kind of address that not right now right now it's being designed more to address the emergency that we're in of just rapid degradation of ecosystems and um, the implications for human well being that come from that. But over the longer term, we really need to advance this much deeper shift that everyone here in Stockholm is working on and thinking about. And um, that is, in many ways, a, a great challenge and also a joy to be working on. So, anyway, thank you for your question. and. Looking forward to talking it over more over um, tea in a few minutes, maybe. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Uh, you're always welcome to Stockholm, of course. We love to have you here. So if you want to decide to move here again, we welcome you with open arms. So we have one more question from the floor, and when, then one from the Zoom, and then I will give the word to Carl to just close the session. So yes, please. Hi. I'm Daniel. I am doing my PhD at the SRC on economics of planetary boundaries. I have uh, one question, reflection, and then another question. It was it's building on what Lan uh, was discussing, and also you guys discussed before. Uh, wouldn't it be that the stocks are directly or inversely related to the flows? On like like if you have a forest or and it's nearby uh, an agricultural land, by having more, like more forest, you will have more they will say uh, ecosystem services to provide to the agricultural land and then that will provide more GEP. If that will be kind of yes, then uh, wouldn't it be that when graph together the GEP with uh, GDP, it will be kind of an, a, a U shape, like uh, there will be like a tipping point where you cannot achieve more GDP without sacrifice, sacrificing more GEP and like this kind of turning point. This kind of, I don't know, maybe it's too abstract. And then the second one is- that sounds like chapter two of your thesis. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> don't send that to my supervisor. <laughs> um, and then the second question is, um, if a GEP relies on economic data, like for the assessment, is there any way this metric is influenced by market data in the sense like, for example, last year that we have these uh, pikes on uh, trade, for example, that food prices were off the charts, will that somehow affect the output of GEP or not really? So any guidance on chapter two? <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to answer chapter two first? I'm going to chapter three. Um, well, my first take on chapter two is that um, it's, I really look forward to reading that chapter. Um, <laughs> A lot depends on the functional relationships 
that can be quite complex and contrasting across the different stocks of natural capital and the different benefit flows that come from them in different configurations. So I'd actually want to play it through and maybe I've become much slower than your um, amazing brain. Maybe you can tell what it would look like quickly, assuming, um, you know, like an exponential decay function between forest, pollinators and pest control agents in farmland. But there's so many other services at play that operate on different spatial scales and with different um, dynamics um, that it's kind of interesting to think through. And I, I think it would be a really good chapter to develop. Maybe Steve's already calculated uh, the overall answer Then I'll turn to him. <laughs> Steve, please. Well, I was actually gonna go to chapter three, but, uh, um, but actually I think what Gretchen said, I mean, there are, you, you, one can imagine, I mean, there's so many different ways uh, that the change in the stocks can lead to changes in the flows. Um, you know, so one can imagine, for example, that there's a tipping point at some place. If I go, you know, if I've, if I've constrained the habitat too much, all of a sudden the one of the, what was it? 700, 800, 800, <laughs> 800 varieties of bees collapses without, an, you know, so I don't think there's going to be a standard answer for, for that question, but I think it's a really interesting question and worth pursuing in context of, of various uh, ones of these. Um, the second thing on the on the prices. Um, so normally, just as kind of best practice, we, we typically use um, average prices over a range and try to make them representative. So yes, if we had a spike in prices this year, we wouldn't, you know, just use those prices and say, oh, look, GDP, you know, like GDP, whatever is has, has you know skyrocketed. So so we try to factor out kind of you know ex, uh, extraordinary events, use sort of average or mean prices over a, over a time period um, to, to try to get that. But one thing you actually do have to, um, that we do have to be cognizant about, and I think more so than the GDP people, which is that oftentimes, you know, the prices reflect the market distortions that are in the market. So, you know, in cases where we know that something is wrong with the market, um, and in particular, if it's because there's some damage to the environment that's not being fully reflected, you know, we're trying to capture that through the GEP, but, you know, like coal prices, like coal prices don't take in the CO2. Well, maybe they do in, in Europe, but they don't in the U.S. Uh, okay, I'm getting shakes. No, they don't hear it either. But um, so, you know, we're trying to actually say, well, you know, to really factor in, you know, to, to figure out what the market price of coal should be, you actually have to factor in. What are the carbon consequences? What are the air pollution consequences? Um, the negative consequences to the environment of actually mining the coal and so on. Okay. Thanks. Thanks a lot. So now the last the question. As well. Well, yeah, yeah, the postdoc. <laughs> Many chapters in the postdoc. <laughs> Many things still needs to be solved. So one last question from Luis on the internet. Yeah. Well, it's sort of going to be three <laughs> jam pack. So this is challenging your jet lag. So first one from Belinda, I thought it was really interesting. Do you think GEP is better able to plug the gap of, of uh, accounting for cultural service and other services that are more intangible? So that's one. And then from Maria von Euler, um, who owns the question of GEP today? And how can one contribute? And I thought you could close with that. Thanks. A threefold question. Who wants to start? What was the first question? Again? <laughs> the gap. Is that Belinda? Yeah. Um, I so um, always in doing these um, assessments and where you're trying to be comprehensive. Um, look, the material services are the easiest. Then come the regulating services, which we, we have done a fair amount with. So regulating services like the pollinators or controls of pests or filtering of air and water. And we've made great progress there. And then at the end of the train is the cultural services or the uh, non-material services. Actually, I don't use the word cultural services anymore. So it best um, converted me to say non-material services because there is a cultural component in all services, like food production, I mean, you know, think about cuisines, and and so there's a cultural component in, in almost everything. But in the non-material services, like 
the aesthetic value of nature um, or the experiential value of nature. Um, th these are things which, you know, we have concepts for, but quantifying them is really far behind. Um, and so we do not do an adequate job right now uh, of them. And I, you know, it's... <laughs> what about it, Carl? <laughs> Yeah, um, I, I think I think some of the, some of them we 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 can, you know, like the health consequences we're we're making progress on, and I you know the aesthetics too. In in certain instances, we're making progress, but I still think that's of of the set of things. I think that's the hardest, um, and I'm not sure that G. I I think GEP actually reflects the challenges of the field. I'm, I I don't think we're uniquely suited to solve those problems or uniquely challenged by them. We so what was it? Remind us, Louise. What was the second question? Sort of who owns the GEP and how can one contribute? That was question two and three, I guess. Who owns? <laughs> this was from Maria von Euler. Excellent. Could we ask Maria? I don't fully understand question two in terms of who owns it. I guess um, sort of where is the who who owns it in terms of like runs it or hold, holds it all together and i'll she'll correct me yeah oh that's the beauty of it is that um it's really beginning to take off um and we hope it becomes owned by everyone in the ideal so right now um there are many um people from many different countries who have contributed to developing the idea is actually in, embodied in the platform that the Natural Capital Partnership maintains that's free and open source um, and um, by design, you know, to be as inclusive as possible. So um, all of the data are openly available and the methodology is openly available. And the purpose of this United Nations Global Environment Facility um, effort that we're launching in April, um, really led by Mary, who got to jump up here and tell you a bit about coastal um, services, is um, to build and develop capacity, um, both to deploy kind of what's been advanced so far, but also really to help shape and refine and open up, you know, new pathways of development for GEP. So we hope very much that it um, is soon owned by quote everyone. So thanks a lot for everything. I will actually hand it, the mic over to Carl to, to with some closing or go up in the. Should we stand behind? Uh, hello, hello there. <laughs> well, two really beautiful hours. Uh, fantastic. Uh, his, uh, Marlin Falkmark, who worked with us before, who once said, uh, when you produce something that is really stunning, it's an instant classic. And I think uh, this has not been really instant, but it's, it's already a classic. And I think we're going to follow carefully uh, how GEP is now developing as, as, as a measure for the uh, economy in the Anthropocene, as you said there, Tom. I think it's quite fantastic. And if you compare it, compare it to when we started with all this stuff in the early 90s, that then you had cost benefit to try to add a few of these values. Here, here you come with a whole portfolio of, of uh, nature's contribution and ecosystem services and put them together as a whole into uh, in what it means for, for progress and economic development. So beautiful. And thanks for taking the time to give this talk and to entertain us like this for two hours. Big hand. Thank you.